we find peace. Amen. Today we're going to look at a text that I think is important for us. I've entitled the message today, Prison to Peace. Now, our property sits adjacent to Florida State Prison. And, and as you all know that have lived around here long enough, this is where the worst of the worst criminals live. And live out the rest of the days of their lives, and many of them on death row will be put to death behind bars. But I want you to understand something about what I'm going to talk about today and what I think is in the text today is I want you to know that many times we as free people still live a life in prison. We still subject ourselves to prison. And I hope you will see this in a moment in the text today. So I've entitled the message Prison to Praise because there is praise, there is peace that we all need in our life. And a lot of times we're the reason we're behind bars. We're, we're the reason that the door has not been flung open. I almost think it like this, like we have the key, but we refuse to use it. And today I hope you see that we're not the only ones who've ever felt this way. We're not the only ones who've ever felt like our fear is going to keep us inside locked walls and locked doors. So we're going to look at this today in John chapter 20, if you will turn your Bibles there. We are going to be looking at verse 19 through 23. So if you would stand in the honor of reading of God's word, John chapter 20, starting verse 19, reads this way. When it was evening on that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Let's go to the Lord in prayer one more time today. God, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the worship that we've experienced. God, we started this off by reading your word today, by celebrating you that we are here to worship you. We finished before we read opened the word today, singing about the goodness of you. And oh God, I pray that that is a reality that we understand. That we are here to worship you. You are the only one worthy of worship. And that God, when we are saved, and have trusted you with our eternal life, we are experienced the goodness of God. And so I pray today, God, that you would help us to see in the text that we no longer need to live in fear, imprisoned by our own thoughts, our own actions, but that, God, we can live in peace and praise you. And so, God, speak to us now. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated couple things that I want you to see today with this idea of prison to praise. We see it here in very first verse, in verse 19, is this, is that Jesus takes our fear and he gives us peace. The Bible says it was on that same evening. What evening is that? That was on the, the resurrection. This was Easter Sunday, and that evening, the men, and, and I believe, based on study of other scriptures, that it was probably more than just the 11 disciples. Many believe it was just the 11 disciples. I think there were more in the room that night, personally. But, but whatever the number was, whoever they were, they were followers of Jesus, and they were gathered in an upper room, locked inside a house. But you need to understand, they weren't only really locked inside the house, they were locked inside the gates, the walls that surrounded the house. And they were locked in. They were not going anywhere. They were scared. They were afraid. It's no doubt, though, that they would have gathered. I'm sure that by now they have been hearing of from the witnesses, Peter, John, Mary Magdalene, we've already studied, that, that Jesus has arisen, that he is no longer in the grave. They're probably gathering so they can try to understand what is really going on here, what is really happening. But the biggest reason they've gathered is because they have found themselves afraid. And who are they afraid of? The Bible teaches us that they are afraid of the Jews. You see, if they would and could have Jesus killed, and now Jesus is no longer in the tomb, who do you think the Jewish authorities are going to want to go after next? 
And they took this. They became afraid. Like, no longer afraid of the saving power, of, or no longer confident in the saving power of Jesus, but they were wrapped up in the fear of the Jews, the one who had Jesus killed. And so can you imagine being in this room, hearing stories that Jesus is alive, you have not seen it for yourself, you're hearing stories, you're gathering information, but you're really afraid that somebody's going to kill you enough that you've locked yourself into this room, that the actual gates are locked, and then all of a sudden Jesus shows up before you. Here he is. If they thought they saw a ghost when he was walking on water, what do you think they were thinking at that moment in time? But there's a difference. Jesus isn't standing before them as a ghost. He's standing before them bodily. You'll you'll see the importance of that in a moment but I, I want you to see this so here they are afraid of the Jews Jesus shows up now here's what I'm thinking now only are they not afraid of the Jews but I'm thinking they're probably afraid of Jesus too now wouldn't you be I mean if at his crucifixion you scattered and ran and left him to hang on that cross by himself and you're supposed to be one of his disciples, one of his followers and you've now deserted him and all of a sudden he has died, been put in a grave. You know that to be true. You're hearing stories of his resurrection and here he stands before you. I'm sure you're thinking, Daddy's done brought the belt now. He's here. and He's going to come and he's going to discipline us. I'm sure their fear was multiplied at this point in time. But again, I told you he was resurrected. He was in their presence. No, not a ghost, but bodily. Jesus was bodily there. Don't ask me to try to explain to you how a body can walk through those walls. Because the fleshly, earthly bodies that we know about can't. But a glorified body. One that Christ is in at this point in time has somehow made it through the gate without unlocking it and has now somehow made it through the door without unlocking it and he stands before them. The only thing that I can think to give you an answer to is found in the Bible. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting in verse 42. It reads this way. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption. Raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. But here's Jesus before him. Again, I I can't imagine to think that they were anything less than have this amplified fear that they were standing before They have to be recognizing that this is the one that they have deserted. This is the one that they have abandoned. This is the one that they've left on their own. But Jesus does something interesting. He doesn't take his belt off and begin to say, line up, it's time for your spankings. He doesn't offer them some kind of condemnation or punishment. Jesus addresses them with these words, peace be with you. Now, this isn't how you and I would normally address people. We we did it all morning this morning. Hey, how are you today? How you doing today? It's good to see you today. Hello. Hi. No, no, Jesus knew their emotional state. This would be more like a, hey, 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 look at me. How are you? Peace. I've not come in harm. I've come to bring you peace. Like This is a one-on-one intimate moment. Jesus is saying, peace with you. Not a normal hello. He's calming their fear. He is taking it away from them and giving them peace. Something that they don't think they deserve. Have you ever felt that way, church? I know often when I think about how I feel like I'm treating the Lord sometimes, I wonder why he would forgive me. I don't have peace in my life because of the things that I say or the things that I do or the things that I think sometimes. And yet Jesus always shows up, doesn't he? And he comes in and he says, peace with you. 
I, I think this is us, church. If I'm honest, I, I think that we deal with this personally. I think sometimes we deal with the church. But I want you to understand something. In our fear, we imprison ourselves. We find ourselves locked behind walls of our minds and we just can't seem to get out of them. In our fear, we think irrationally. In our fear, we think that we're unlovable. And in our fear, we think that we are unforgivable. It's irrational. It's a place that the enemy wants us to be. You see, they, they are sitting here thinking that they are afraid. And they probably feel all of these same thoughts that I just expressed to you. Because that's what the enemy wants us to think. And the disciples are thinking that their enemy is the Jews. When reality is their enemy is Satan. The evil one. Your enemy, my enemy is not the Jews. It's not a people group out there. Your enemy and my enemy is Satan. What a miserable life to live in fear. When Jesus is saying to you, as he is the disciples, peace be with you. You are loved in Jesus' eyes. You are cherished in Jesus' eyes. You are valuable in Jesus' eyes. You are forgiven. And you can be restored. See, Jesus came and appeared before those disciples and he calls us today to take away our fear. He wants us to to, to give up the fear and come to him because he has something better. And that get better gift that he wants to offer us is eternal life. He is the good father, the forgiving father. So he takes our fear and he gives us peace. But I thought about it. There's going to be a simple statement. But I really think it's kind of profound if we would apply it. And that is this. Peace is experienced when we allow Jesus to remove our fears. I, you cannot, church, you cannot have peace if you don't have Jesus. There's only one source of true peace, and it is found in Christ and Christ alone. It is found in our belief that he allows us to experience peace. It is through our trust that he allows us to experience this peace. It is through our commitment to him that he allows us to experience this peace. Amen. And so here's what he says to you today, church. Maybe you are struggling with some sort of fear. Maybe you have found yourself imprisoned by some crazy idea that you can't seem to shake. Here's what Jesus is saying to you today. What he says to me when I find myself in these places. Peace be with you. This is intimate peace. This is rooted into the bones. Allowing you to let all of those irrational fears leave you. Because you have a good father. Who's going to care for you. And guide you and lead you and offer you peace. Now I want you to move on to the next thing. We see this in verse 20. Jesus provides the evidence. And when he provides the evidence, it's going to lead to rejoicing. I want you to think for a moment with me. Your salvation. For those of you who have given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to think for a moment the day you were saved. Did you not experience peace that day? And were you not experiencing some form of rejoicing? Were you not excited about your salvation? I've talked to some of you in here that we've actually baptized, so we've got to see the whole process of how, how God worked and how he called you and hear your testimonies and then see you get baptized and be part of that process. And listen, I'm telling you, those people that I've talked to like that, it is evident of their rejoicing of their salvation that is found in Christ. But listen, he is going to provide the evidence to us. I'm sure here, as we see in verse 20, having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. I'm sure that when he first pops in the walls there and says, peace be with you, I'm sure they had that look on their face. One of fear and bewilderment and confusion and how what that looks like, I don't even know that I could disfigure my face enough to 
make you wonder what that might look like. But Jesus recognizes this in them. They are confused. They are still afraid. They are wondering, could this really be him? He doesn't say to them, peace be with you. I am going to my Father and leave them. He says, peace be with you. And then recognizing still their condition of them spiritually, emotionally, he says, see my hands, my wrist. You know, we talk about Jesus being nailed to the cross through his hands. It's actually not true. He was actually nailed between the two bones of his wrist so that it would support him on the cross. And then he would have put his two feet together on top of each other in such a way and then nailed both feet together. But he says, see my my wrists, see my feet, see my side, it has been pierced. See, he provides to these disciples all the evidence that they need to know of who he is. I want you to understand this, Jesus' glorified body still displays the scars of the cross. It still displays his crucifixion. He has nail-scarred wrist, feet still scarred, his side still scarred. Jesus knew they needed peace, and he gave it to them. But he also knew they needed proof. Have you ever felt that way? Just, just think back to your own salvation for a moment. Did you need proof? Did you need some kind of evidence? What about since you've been saved? Have you often wondered about some evidence or some proof? These men were closest to Jesus. Three years with him. He told them everything that was going to happen. It happens. They're not even 24 hours out of his resurrection. And they are wondering and confused and dismayed. Have you ever felt that way? I felt that way. I've asked some questions of myself. I've sought out certain things in God's word because I want to know the truth. Because here's what I know about Jesus. He doesn't want us wandering around aimlessly doubting or questioning, is he the Savior? That's not his plan for you and I. He wants us to be able to get rid of all of our fear. He wants us to have peace. He doesn't want us to have doubt. He wants us to be confident in who he says he is. And listen. Can we really, truly rejoice in Christ if we're not confident that he's the Savior of the world? Can you rejoice if you're not confident that he's the Savior? I I, I would answer the question that you need to trust the evidence. I would tell you to look around. There's plenty of it. I would tell you to look and to seek. And here's what I know about my Lord. You will find. He in his sovereignty, he in his providence, he will make a way for you to know for sure that he is who he said he is, just like he did the disciples on that very day when he said, see my wrist, see my feet, see my side. He will make us aware. And here is what I promise you, church. I know it was for me the day that I got saved. I don't know that I've ever fully shared my whole testimony with you guys, but when I have tried to share parts of it, I can't talk about it without getting emotional. I can't talk about it without tears flowing from my eyes and rejoicing that the Holy Spirit, that God himself would call me into salvation and be willing to forgive a guy like me. Listen, I'm telling you, it was rejoicing that day. And since that day, have they all been days of rejoicing? No, I've had my struggles. But every time I come back and I think about, man, look what God did in my life. I rejoice because when we have the confidence and we recognize who Jesus is, there's only one result, and that is rejoicing. That is praising him. That is celebrating him. That is worshiping him. And we see here, when they recognized Jesus, they saw the Lord, the Bible says, they rejoiced. There is peace in their lives. And it's expressed in their rejoicing of him. Church, I I often wonder sometimes when I come in here on Sunday mornings, are we going to come in with an attitude of rejoicing? 
Are we going to come in with an attitude of worship? Are we going to come in with an attitude of, it's just another thing to do? Or every time we come in here, is that cross going to be the center of everything that we do? There's a reason why we moved the cross to the baptistry. Because it should be the center of all that we come in here for. Is to rejoice in him because we are confident that he is the salvation that we need. He is the one who was once dead and is now alive. Listen, he's not on, you, you don't see Jesus on that cross any longer. He was dead and is now alive. And because of that, grace abounds and mercy abounds and salvation is secure. And I'm telling you, when you meet Jesus, your mourning will turn to rejoicing automatically. How's your rejoicing? You know what? Jesus even told them it would happen. Jesus even said this would happen to them. Look in John chapter 16. We've already studied this, but I want to remind you of it. In verse 20, it says, Truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. Notice what he says. No one will take away your joy. Now, you're probably saying, hey, pastor, life stinks sometimes. Yep, it does. This side of heaven, this side of eternity, sometime life stinks. But here's what I want you to know. Jesus overcomes your sorrow. Jesus overcomes you're hurt. Jesus overcomes your fear. You see, I want you to understand something about joy. Joy is constant. It is eternal. It, it doesn't last for a moment and burn out on a candle like, like happiness might. But it goes on and on and on. We can experience our joy daily. We can experience it hourly. We can experience it in the very moment that we exist. Listen, here's what I want you to understand about joy. It is infinite. Do you know why joy is infinite, though? Because its author is infinite. Happiness comes from the word happenstance. And when your happenstance is over, a lot of times your happiness is gone. It's for a moment. But joy, because the author is infinite, is infinite in your life if you will just trust him. And here's what I would tell you. Look at his hands. Church, look at his feet. Look at his side. Look at his cross. He did all that so that you and I didn't have to. Aren't you grateful? Listen, he saved you. So rejoice. Rejoice. I want you to see this last thing in the last couple of verses of the text today is this. Jesus takes our prison and he gives us a purpose. Jesus takes our prison and he gives us a purpose. Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. He said again to them, peace to you. He said it in the beginning. He shows them who he is. And then he says, hey, peace to you. What is he saying here? Listen, have confidence in this. Be sure in this. You can do it. He's like a great ball coach here, encouraging somebody in a team to keep on moving. We have a task or a good boss who says, hey, we've got to get this done. We can do this. And you're capable of completing it. I know oftentimes in my life, there's even been times in my life where I've been scared to share the gospel in certain times. You ever felt that way? Am I the only one? It seems hard sometimes. Like some of the most unloving people are who God calls us to go share the gospel to. We're like, uh-uh, don't send me, God. I can't do that. 
I don't have that personality. I don't have that confrontational personality. I don't, I don't have any of these skills that are needed to take this task and complete it. And Jesus is saying, hey, peace be with you. Peace to you. He is saying, hey, you can do this. Have faith. Be encouraged. You can accomplish this task. But you know what happens? We lock ourselves in a prison. And we think it's just safer to stay inside there. Jesus is saying, no, peace to you. Get ready to go. Don't lock yourself there. Jesus didn't die. Listen to me, church. Jesus didn't die to just put us in this the four walls of our house or or, or a church building, or our car, or the four walls of our office, and just want us to just live this life, this crazy, what some might think miserable life, until we die and spend eternity with Him. No, He wants us outside of our own walls because He has a plan for you and me. We have a mission to accomplish. And that mission comes, listen, follow the, follow the text. It comes because He gave them peace. It comes because he revealed who himself was, and the ultimate response to that was rejoicing. Listen, I don't know about you, but there was a lot of rejoicing at times this year when the Jaguars won. Everybody was thinking they were going to make it to the playoffs, and you didn't have a problem talking about that. Wasn't a lot of rejoicing for us Florida fans this year. But, but things that we enjoy, we share. And listen, I'm just here to tell you that when you got saved, Jesus gave you a mission. You should be rejoicing. You should be excited to take that mission and carry it forward. Why? Because he gave us peace. He takes our sorrow and gives us joy. He takes our lostness and gives us a mission. See, the scripture teaches us here that as the Father has sent me, I also send you. See, Jesus sent, the Father sent Jesus on a specific mission. And honestly, it's, it's a specific mission. It's one that you and I can't do. And that mission was to save the world from its sin. To make a way for the redemption of sin so that it could be applied to sinners' lives so they could have eternal life. You and I could never accomplish that mission. But the Father sent Jesus into the world to do that, and he did it. And now Jesus says, as the Father sent me to fulfill a mission, I am sending you to fulfill a mission. What is that mission? It's to carry the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world. Amen. You know the easiest place to start? I know some of you are going, no, no, Pastor, it's hard. Start with your own family. Just tell them. You know the easiest way to tell your family? Because you know who knows you best, by the way? <laughs> you know who knows every in and out of you? You know who knows your deepest, darkest secrets? Your good and your bad? Your family. So who better than to say, hey, look, this is who I once was, but this is now I am. I once was lost, but now I'm found. They'll see the light. They'll see the difference. Start there. Start with whoever that the Lord puts in your path. The gospel is easy, friends. It's not hard. Acts chapter 13, starting verse 26, says, Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, it is to us that the word of this salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him or the saying of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out all they had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus, as is written in the second song, You are my son, today I become your father. As to raising him from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your Holy One see decay. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sin is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Now, let me explain this in a simple term. That was the gospel. Promised from the beginning of time all the way from Moses to David. You heard it in there. 
The promise that there would be one who would come, who would live a sinless life, who would die, who would be buried and never see decay and would rise again. That was the gospel. Let me tell you, that's been God's intent from all along. Look, it's simple. God created us to be in relationship with him. But something happened. We call that sin, and, and it separated us from God, and we find ourselves removed from Him. And we are broken people. Listen, we are imprisoning ourselves on a daily basis often, and we're looking for ways out of this. You can fill in your way that you sought to run from God. You could say, for many years I did these kinds of things because I was broken and fallen and separated from God. And then you could... Draw a third circle in the bottom if you see where I'm going with this. If any of you know the three circles model of sharing the gospel, you could draw a circle in the bottom. You could put a cross in it. You could draw an arrow down and and an arrow up. And you can say, but God sent his son Jesus to come to live a sinless life, to die on a cross so that he could make a way of redemption, of reconciliation of his creation to himself. It's a circle, but it takes Jesus. And all we have to do is just explain that. I was once lost, a sinner. This was my life. This is what it was like. This is what I used to do. And then one day Jesus called me and I answered. And here's what my life has been like since. And I wouldn't have it any other way. You can share this with anybody that you come in contact with. But listen, you know what else is interesting? It would be one thing for Jesus to just say, hey, I've empowered you with this mission. I've called you to go. As the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. You know what's incredible, though? Do you know that Jesus didn't just use those words to empower us? In Acts, if we know a whole lot about Pentecost, if you were here when we went through Acts, you would know what we're talking about right now. And if you don't, I'm going to explain it real quick. But on Pentecost, Peter preached, and the Holy Spirit fell. And from that day forward, anytime somebody gave their life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in that person. God said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, Acts 1a, you will be my witnesses. God has empowered us to do so. Listen, if he just depended on me to do it, it would never happen. Would you agree with me? If you were as dependent upon you and you alone to go share the gospel to a lost and dying world, would you be able to accomplish it? Probably not. But as a believer, somebody who's been forgiving and rejoicing in this salvation, I have good news to go share someone, excited to do it, and now I have the power to do it. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to me and lives in me. Listen, I'm going to read a couple things to you. We were not saved to be silent. We were not saved to be secluded. We were not saved to remain in the bondage of sin. We were not saved to be imprisoned in this life. Galatians 5 once, my wife's life verse. For freedom Christ sets us free. Stand firm then and do not submit again to the yoke of of slavery freedom you've been set free did you experience that freedom when you gave your life to christ was it not cause you to rejoice and to feel overwhelmed sense of gratitude and love and be able to say thank you jesus for this if you felt that way when god saved you why do you not want everybody else to experience that Do you know how they're going to experience that? Because blessed are the hands and the feet that take the gospel to the nations of the world. If we don't do it, who will? If we don't do it, who will? People need this message. People need this hope. People need this assurance. What am I telling you? People need salvation. Acts 4, 12. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Church, we are the messengers of the greatest news ever. And our mission field is a lost and dying world that we come in contact with. Here's what, I want, here's what I want to tell you. He commissioned the disciples that day. And he told them, as the Father sends me, I'm sending you. 
So that if we take God at his word, and if you believe that all of this is the inerrant word of God, which I do, there's no mistakes in it, it's true. If the Holy Spirit led men to pen it and to write it, when he speaks to the disciples, here's what I want to tell you. He speaks to you and me. And if he commissioned the disciples to go into the world and share the good news of Jesus, then I'm here to tell you on the authority of God's word, he is commissioning you and me. We are to go and to share the good news. So what what am I telling you? Don't live in fear. Do not imprison yourself any longer. God gave you peace. He he, he gave you the evidence that you need that he is truly the salvation that is needed to the world. And he now has taken you out of a prison and he has set you free. And therefore to go do a work that he's called you to. Here's what I want us to do, church. I want us to begin to live in this joy. I want you to begin to live in this joy. And I want you to overcome the fear. I would challenge you this week. Find one person. Find one person that you know is not saved and share your story. Give the gospel and see what lives can be changed by your faithfulness to tell your story, to living in joy. Because God's given you that peace. Listen. Jesus takes our fear, he gives us peace. Jesus provides the evidence, and the proof leads to rejoicing. And Jesus takes our prison, and he gives us purpose. You know why some of us are miserable? Why some of us live inside the church, and we come to church, and we we, we, we get in to find ourselves debating and talking about things that don't really matter in the bigger picture of things? You want to know why? It's because we're not living in our purpose. You want to find joy? Live in your purpose. Complete your purpose. Fulfill your purpose. And I promise you, you will experience more and more and more of your Savior. And you will fall more and more in love with Him. You will find more and more joy. And you will find yourself fulfilling the purpose of God more and more. It is fulfilled. Our joy is fulfilled when we fulfill the purpose that He's given us. Listen, He didn't just save you to save you. One day you are going to spend all of eternity at his feet like Mary Magdalene clinging to him. And he's going to tell you, you can hang on forever. But for now he's saying, don't cling to me. Don't cl-. Listen, let me tell you what I think he would say to the church. He'd say, don't cling to your church building. Go. I used to think life was long. Everybody over 50 is laughing. <laughs> These guys over here are thinking, it is. You're all a bunch of old people. <laughs> Life is short. It's short. Young people, life is short. I heard somebody say one time, and this will be true if we'll just live on purpose, that we have all eternity to celebrate our victories. But church, we only have one life to win them. Life is short. Are you living on purpose? Are you fighting the battle? I'm here to tell you, some of you will plant, some of you will water, some of you will fertilize, and others will reap. Let me tell you what the evidence of that will be. The kingdom will be growing. If we'll just live on purpose. Stop imprisoning ourselves, living in fear. Live in peace and go and share. Be happy about your salvation. I'm going to ask the team to come up as we get ready to enter into a time of invitation. And I think that's where we are today. That that is the invitation. Are you living in fear? Do Do you feel trapped by walls in this world? Even though you may not be in a real prison, do you feel like you're imprisoned at times in your life? Does something just have you trapped in your mind and you just can't seem to get out of it? Maybe you've never really truly experienced the peace. That that peace, you know, the Bible teaches that surpasses all understanding. Maybe you're just not experiencing that. Maybe it's because you don't know him. Maybe it's because you've never given your life to him. 
Well, today you can get rid of that fear. You can break the bondage of those prison walls in your own life. And you can come down here and you can say, Pastor, I no longer want to live in that fear. I need Jesus. I need this peace so that I can rejoice. So that I can have what you're talking about. So I can have a purpose in life. Maybe some of you are struggling with other things in your life. Maybe you know other people who are struggling with things in their lives and they're imprisoning themselves and that the altars will be open. I, I don't know what your decision is. I don't know how the Holy Spirit's working today, but I know he's working. So I just want to encourage you, whatever your decision is, come. I'll be down here to, to greet you and talk with you, pray with you, whatever it is you need. You can come bring somebody else and pray at an altar. But the Holy Spirit speaking to somebody. So whatever your decision is, you come. When I pray, I'm going to say amen. And there's no reason to wait. There's no reason to drag it out any longer than, than you need to. Just respond. You want to join the church? You want to be baptized? You need to give your life to Christ? You want to come pray? You respond. God, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you completed the mission in which the Father sent you for to live that sinless life, to die on that cross, to be buried in that tomb, to not see decay by rising again three days later. And your word says in Romans 10 that if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we will be saved. God, we can have this assurance. We can get rid of the fear and live in this peace. And God, when we experience that peace, we can begin to rejoice in our salvation that's found only in you. And then... We can actually live on a mission that makes sense. For a purpose that matters. So God, I pray whatever's going on in the lives of people today, in their hearts and their minds, I pray that the Holy Spirit is working. I pray, God, that you would have your way. And that, God, people would respond and come and do business during this time of worship with you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand, please.